Hello everyone. Today, I want to discuss the most fundamental topic that you need to know in order to become a confident user of Microsoft Excel. And that topic is how cells are structured in this program. If this video seems too fast or slow to you, then you can easily choose the playback speed that suits you. And if you want to watch videos without sound, then just turn on subtitles. I wish you a pleasant viewing. So let's get started. As you can see, the entire Excel worksheet is made up of these cells. I can navigate between cells by using the left mouse button or the arrow keys on the keyboard. At first glance, it may seem like all cells are exactly the same, and that is true to some extent, but there is a nuance. Each cell has its own name. Pay attention to the field that displays the cell name when I select any cell. For example, right now, I have selected cell F7. And now it's B2. And now H4. And so on. By the way, the name is assigned based on the cell's address. And determining the address of a cell is very easy to do on your own. The entire worksheet is made up of rows and columns. Each row has its own number. For example, I have currently selected the ninth row. Now let's move on to columns. Unlike rows, they are not denoted by numbers but by Latin letters. By default, Excel is set up this way, although you can choose an option in the program settings where columns, as well as rows, are numbered. But we won't do it that way. So, the address of a cell depends on the specific column and row intersection where it is located. For example, right now I have a cell selected, and as you can see, it is in column G. Now let's shift our attention to the rows, and we can see that it is located in the ninth row. So, we have column G and row 9, which means the cell address is G9. In this case, we can draw a successful analogy with a chessboard. However, in Excel, we don't have to search for the cell address each time by looking at the rows and columns because, as I showed you earlier, the cell address is always displayed in that field. Additionally, the column and row that correspond to the selected cell are automatically highlighted on the sheet. So, we have just learned that all cells have their own individual address, and we have learned how to determine it. I hope that is clear. Now let's take a small detour. You may be wondering, how many rows and columns are there on a sheet? and how many cells can it accommodate? If you scroll the mouse wheel down or press the down arrow key or hold the corresponding key on the keyboard, you will continuously move through the rows in the specified direction. Look how quickly I exceeded the mark of a thousand rows, and the sheet still doesn't end. It gives you the feeling that it has no end or edge. But if there are still debates about the infinity of the universe, with Excel, it's quite simple and clear. Of course, it has its limits. Now I will press the combination of control plus down arrow key. This instantly takes me to the very last row numbered 1,048,576. However, this number may vary depending on the version of Excel. The same applies to columns. They are denoted by alphabetical order. And when the alphabet comes to an end, it starts again, but with the addition of the first letter, and so on. For example, here we have the letter Z, which is the last letter of the alphabet, and then, to avoid having duplicate column names, we add the letter A. Let's continue scrolling and, as you may have already guessed, the letter B is added to the alphabet. And so on, in the same order. And if I press the combination of Ctrl plus right arrow key, I'll end up in the farthest column of this sheet, which is denoted by the letters XFD. As you noticed, I quickly moved to the end of the sheet using the key combinations. And similarly, I can return to the very beginning. To do this, I simultaneously press Ctrl and left arrow, and up arrow keys. Excellent! There are a total of 16,384 columns on a single sheet. And the total number of cells is 17,179,869,184. Impressive, isn't it? However, in practice, only a small fraction of the available cells are used. Generally, if you have many tables and charts, it is much more convenient to place them not on a single sheet, but on multiple sheets. That's why the Excel file is called a workbook. So, a cell represents the main structural element of a sheet, where data is stored. In other words, it's like a separate container for storing something. 
Let me now select a cell with the cursor and write something in it. Let it be the number 20. I press enter, and now I have cell E6 containing a specific value in the form of the number 20. Now I'll switch to the adjacent cell with the address F6 by pressing the tab key once. In this cell, I enter an equal sign, and from that moment, the Excel program will automatically recognize my further actions in the cell as entering a formula, and it will continue to do so as long as the cell is active. In other words, Excel transitions into a calculator mode that is automatically activated after entering the equal sign. Next, I write 10 plus 10 and press the Enter key to get the result. Done, the calculator has accomplished its task. And now pay attention, both cells, seemingly, are not distinguished from each other, at least there's no external difference. But in reality, there is a fundamental difference between them, which will give us different ways of using these cells in the future. Just above the sheet is the so-called formula bar. In this bar, the content of the selected cell is displayed. Right now, it is empty, but see what happens when I select cell E6. As you have already noticed, the formula bar shows us exactly what is in the cell, which is the number 20. And now comes the most interesting part. I select the adjacent cell, and this time, the formula bar shows me not the number 20, but the formula that resulted in this number. Thus, it becomes evident that the cell displays not its actual content but the result. For example, in the first cell, I simply entered the number 20 without any conditions, so the result in this cell exactly matches its content. That cannot be said for the second cell, where its actual content is a formula, and that's why we see the result of the calculation on the sheet. For greater clarity, I switch to the Formulas tab and click on this icon. Now you can see the true content of the cells. Okay, I believe this is clear. I'll switch back to the standard view. Next. These two cells that I filled are considered independent. Their content will not be affected by other cells because there is no connection between them. But with dependent cells, it's a different story. It works as follows. I enter an equal sign in cell G6. And as an example, I click on cell E6. I press enter. What happened? To help you understand better, I will start changing the value in cell E6. As you can see, all changes are immediately duplicated in cell G6, all because it now fully depends on cell E6 as it references it. Let's take a look at the formula bar for cell G6. Here is an equal sign, followed by E6, and the Excel program understands this as the value of this cell always being equal to the value of cell E6. It doesn't matter what I enter here. Instead of a number, I can type text or enter a formula. Either way, the established link will be maintained. All right, let's move on. Now let's look at how cells behave when they are semi-dependent. I put an equal sign in a cell with the address H6 and enter a formula. Only this time, my formula will have both a regular value and a reference to a specific cell. I have now entered the number 10. This is a regular value that I typed using the keyboard. Now I enter a plus sign and specify a reference to cell F6. I press enter. Done. I think you can already guess what will happen if I start changing the value in cell F6. Let's look at the formula bar. The number 10 here is a static value, or it can also be called a constant. While the value of F6 directly depends on what is in cell F6. In other words, the 10 always remains unchanged, while the adjacent term will change if I make changes to cell F6. And now pay close attention to my actions. If you are confused, let's go through everything step by step. I have just demonstrated to you the relationship between these four cells. As soon as I make changes to cell E6, it automatically affects the other three cells. Why does this happen? Let's look at the formula bar again. Look at each of them.
When I change the value in E6, the following algorithm is triggered. First, cell G6 reacts to the change because it refers to E6. Then, cell F6 reacts, which in turn refers to G6. And only then are the changes registered in cell H6, which refers to F6 and is partially dependent. That's the interesting relationship we have. I understand that there are many nuances, and this is just the beginning, but it's very important to understand them, otherwise you will get confused when working with tables whose cells have more complex relationships. Let's continue. The Excel program allows us to create tables with interconnected data, not limited to just one sheet or workbook. What do I mean? Let's say I have created multiple tables and they are on different sheets, and I need to make changes to one table that directly affect the data in another table. We're talking about interconnected cells. To illustrate this, let me create a second sheet. As an example, I will fill in one of the cells. And then I return to the first sheet. I select any free cell, enter an equal sign, and switch back to the new sheet. I click on cell C3 and press enter. This way, I have set up a link between cells on different sheets. And now the value in cell I6 will depend on the value in cell C3, which is located on the second sheet. Let's take a look at the formula bar. After the equal sign, the address of the cell we're referring to is specified. We are referencing cell C3 in this particular case, and to avoid any confusion, the program also specifies the name of the sheet where the cell is located. An exclamation mark serves as a separator between the sheet name and the cell address. If I change the sheet's name now, it will also change in the formula bar. Let's see the result. Yes, this time, the new sheet name is specified in the formula. The most observant of you will have noticed that unlike the previous formula, this one includes two apostrophe signs. The program added them automatically. The thing is, Excel uses special separators between the elements of a formula. My formula is quite small and easy to navigate, but sometimes formulas are so large they barely fit into this bar, and it's easy to get confused looking at them. As a vivid example, I will remove all these separators. Firstly, this formula will not function now, as a result the cell displays an error, thereby the program is asking the user to pay attention to the formula and make the necessary corrections. Secondly, the formula itself now looks totally incomprehensible, and it's difficult for us to understand what it consists of. To prevent this from happening, the developers of the program have created special separators, and you just need to remember them. We will discuss this in more detail in the lessons dedicated to Excel functions, but still, let me give you a head start to explain why apostrophe signs are used in formulas. Let's add them back. Look. The name of my sheet consists of the two words table and sales, and there is a space between them. So, in this case, apostrophes make it clear that both words are part of the single sheet name, and not separate elements of the formula. For example, in the first case, the program didn't put apostrophes because the name of the sheet does not contain spaces it is one word. And these signs are here so that we don't mistakenly take these two words, separated by a space, as separate elements of our formula. As I already said earlier, the exclamation mark serves as a separator, which lets us know that here the formula element in the form of the sheet name ends and another element starts, which is the cell address. We've sorted that out. What about linking cells from different books? I go to the File tab, and as an example, I will open this book. Now I have two working windows running, and this time when entering the formula, I will refer to a cell from a book I've just opened. I complete the formula by pressing enter and get the corresponding result in this cell, which is directly linked to another Excel document. All this provides us the opportunity to create various interrelated reports and manage large projects without any restrictions. 
Moreover, shared access can be granted to Excel documents. Thanks to this option, company employees can work in one shared book, even though they are located in different parts of the world. And we are only just beginning to reveal the astonishing power of Excel to ourselves. So, let's continue. At this point, we know that the contents of a cell do not always coincide with the result that is displayed on the screen. A cell can contain a value, formula, reference to another cell, and the cell we reference can be on the current sheet or any other. You can even refer to cells from other Excel files. In fact, this is far from the complete list of what a cell can contain. Now, you have a fundamental understanding necessary at this stage of learning. However, this topic will gradually be explored more deeply as you progress through the course. So, it's time to talk about cell formatting. On one hand, the format determines how a cell looks, and on the other, it affects how the data is processed. The topic is also quite extensive, so now we'll only discuss the most basic aspects. On the ribbon, there are various tools that you can use to change the appearance of cells. Let me select cell H6 and change the font. I'll make it bolder. Increase the size. Fill the cell, change the font color to white. And align the text to the center. Of course, the main tool needed for formatting tables is also located in this block and it is responsible for adding borders. A border is a line that surrounds specific individual cells or entire cell ranges. For now, let's take a look at a separate example. I click on this icon and a drop-down list appears. It contains different types of borders. Each one has its name and sample in the form of a small drawing. I choose this option and as you can see, the cell now has borders. Now I'll set borders for a whole range of cells. Holding down the left mouse button, I select the required area. Then I return to the ribbon. This time, I'll choose the All Borders command. To remove the selection, I simply click on any cell with the mouse. Done. In essence, if all these cells are properly filled in, we have a complete table. Thanks to borders, ordinary cell ranges are visually separated from the main sheet, and it's much more comfortable to work with them. If necessary, you can even hide the rest of the cells on the sheet. To do this, go to the View tab and remove the checkmark in the checkbox that controls the grid display. Here's how it looks. Don't worry, the cells haven't disappeared, you just can't see them now. The same can be done with headers and the formula bar. Now, I will return to the default view. So, we have just gotten familiar with some tools that can affect the appearance of cells, and all of this pertains to formatting. The format, like the value or formula, is a cell content. Let's take a close look at cell H6, or rather, what it consists of. Firstly, it's a value in the form of a number displayed inside the cell. Secondly, it has a formula, which resulted in this value. And thirdly, this cell has a format in the form of fill, borders, and so on. To make it clearer to you, I will copy this cell. To do this, I will select it and press the Ctrl plus C key combination. The animation that appears in the form of a moving border indicates to us that from this moment on, all the information associated with the cell, including its contents, has been placed, or more precisely, duplicated in the so-called clipboard. It is a temporary storage for copied or cut data so that we can paste them in other places. Only the appropriate place needs to be selected, let it be cell K6. I click on it once to select and press the Ctrl plus V key combination to paste the copied data. Done, the cell has been copied. But a reasonable question arises, why does its value differ? Here we have 30? And there is a completely different number? The thing is, when copying, the formula shifts. Pay attention to cell H6 in the formula bar, we see that when calculating, it refers to cell F6, located one column to the left. So after copying, the formula shifts, while maintaining its original structure. Therefore, if we look at the formula bar of cell K6, we will find that the formula still refers to the cell located one column to the left, just like in the first example, that is, 
the formula structure is preserved, and the reference address is adjusted based on the address of the cell into which the copied data were pasted. The 10 in the formula remains unchanged, it is a simple and static value. While the reference to the cell is changed, so now it adds 200 to the 10 instead of 20. However, I can paste the copied data either fully or partially. In this example, I did a full paste, including the formula and formatting. Now I will show you other paste options. I am copying the H6 cell again. I select a place for insertion. And this time, I right-click. Here, the paste options interest me. From the specified options, I can tell the program what exactly needs to be pasted from the copied data. As you remember, the cell contains various things. For example, the program suggests pasting everything complete, and a little to the right, there is an option according to which only the value will be inserted. Let me choose that. So, I just copied cell H6, but out of all its contents, I only inserted the value, which is presented as a number 30, into a new cell. Notice that the formula is missing per se in the formula bar, as I did not give the command to insert it, the format is also missing, so the font here is defaulted, there is no fill, and there is no border. I believe this is clear. Let's go a little further down and I will insert the copied formula. The clipboard is still active, so I go to the paste options and select the option from the suggested list to paste the formula. Now let's look at the formula bar. Everything is correct. The formula is copied and it shifted so it's not surprising that the result is displayed as the number 10. After all, a value from the empty cell I8, which contains nothing, was added to the 10. Next, lower, I'll insert the format. For this, I will select the appropriate paste option. Well, this time the cell only contains the format, and there are no values in it. A complete list of all possible paste options is in the section, Special Paste. I can even paste copied data in full, except for the borders. In this case, all the contents were inserted, except for the borders. I'll press the ESC key on the keyboard to finish the copying procedure. Done. And now look, we just copied cell H6 together, but in each case, the result was different. Here I inserted all the content in full, and here only the value. Lower just the formula was inserted, then the format, and at the end, I used a special borderless insert. As we have already determined with you, the format is responsible for the appearance of the cell. However, besides the external design, there are also different types of formats in the program that affect how exactly Excel will process cell data. Please note, I have two identical numbers written on my sheet. By default, the Excel document always has a general numeric format installed in all cells. On the tape, in the Home tab, a separate block of formatting tools is highlighted it was named Number. In this field, you can see the current format of the selected cell. As I've already said, originally it will always be common. This is the standard format, with which the program will not process data in a cell in most cases in some special way. In other words, here is how I type this number on the keyboard, and it is displayed on the sheet in this way. To see the difference, let me change the general format to the financial one in the neighboring cell. To do this, I will return to the toolbar, open the drop-down list and select the financial format. The program automatically processed the cell content according to the selected format, and now this number is visually easier to perceive. First, thanks to the comma, there was a division of digits. Secondly, for the greatest accuracy, the number has a fractional part. And thirdly, currency has started to display in the cell. You can go to advanced format settings to set the most suitable parameters for yourself. As usual, Excel offers several ways to solve the same task. I can open the cell format menu by clicking on this icon. Or, click the right mouse button and select the corresponding command. But it's easiest to remember the control plus one key combination. 
So, in the dialog box, there are necessary tabs for format setting, alignment of content in the cell, font, and so on. We have already got acquainted with this at the previous lesson. Now, I am interested in the tab which is called Number. On the left, the selected format is displayed. And on the right, you can change some parameters of this format. I can increase the fractional part by adding the number of characters after the separator. A little higher there is a sample, where the changes made are displayed. If I specify zero in this field, then the fractional part will disappear. Currency designation can also be changed or removed. I press OK. If we are talking about large numbers, then the general format is not suitable at all. Look, I entered a large number in this cell, and it is displayed incorrectly. However, if you change the format, the problem will be solved. The program automatically recognizes some formats. I just entered a date, September 10, 2023, and let's find out what happened to the format. As you can see, Excel itself identified the cell content as a date and assigned it the corresponding format. Now I will show you a clear example of how the program can apply special data processing algorithms depending on the cell format. I'll record another date nearby and perform a simple calculation in a free cell. Look, Excel not only recognized the content of these cells as dates but also performed the mathematical operation correctly. As a result, we found out how many days the difference between these two dates is. Later in this lesson, I want to consider the text format. Suppose you need to enter a number that starts with zero, say this is the serial number of some product. After entering data, zero automatically disappears. To avoid this, you should use the text format. I will specify it in advance before filling the cell. Done. Now zero is also displayed in the cell. By choosing the text format, we as if inform the program that there is just plain text in the cell and no additional changes should be applied to it. So, we got acquainted with the device of cells in the Microsoft Excel program. The topic is extensive, but I hope that you have formed a general understanding. Like the video if you enjoyed the tutorial and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a new video. And with the link in the description and in the first pinned comment, you can provide financial support to the channel, as all lessons are entirely free. I wish you success in learning. Goodbye.